is also the appointed time for the meeting. Can we now ask the administration to come in, please? I welcome the administration representatives to the meeting. You have a name list in front of you, so I will not introduce them. I, I think it's the same team of people. Today, we'll continue to scrutinize the Waterworks Amendment Bill 2017. At the meeting on the 12th of June, near the end of that meeting, Members were discussing paper CB bracket 1, 1093 bracket 2. That is a response to questions raised at the meeting on the 19th of May. Members have already covered items A to D. I'd like to ask members whether you would like to take up items E and F. Would you like the uh, administration to introduce items E and F? Um, if not, then also, on the meeting on the 12th of June, the Bills Committee required the administration to provide information. The response is in paper CB bracket 1, 1050, bracket 02. Perhaps I would ask the administration to walk us through that paper, please. Mr. Vincent Mack, Deputy Secretary. Thank you, Chairman. The response is in two categories. The first is our response to the views expressed by deputations. This is a collective response. Many deputations expressed their views, and now we will give consolidated replies to the different categories. The first one, criminal liability of workers in carrying out specified plumbing works. Deputations asked whether they would be held criminally liable. Our response is that under the current Waterworks Ordinance, any person who carries out Plumbing works in contravention to Section 14.3 of the WWO is guilty of an offence. The proposal in the amendment bill, in fact, seeks to add a new statutory defence provision. If member, uh, if workers can say that they believe that the carrying out of the plumbing works will not contravene Section 43 of the Ordinance, and it is reasonable for the worker to so believe that they can claim that defence provision. The prosecution will have the burden to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the worker commits an offence and that he cannot rely on the defence. It is only in that situation that we will take out prosecution. Please continue. Secondly, Deputations said a lot about workers who did not have the related skills and whether they should have to be trained before they can undertake the plumbing works. Our short response is that very often plumbing works covers a lot of menial or repetitive tasks. And in the past decades, Workers would just work to a master, so to speak. In this way, this will help provide additional workforce and it facilitates workers who will be able to acquire the necessary work skill and experience while they work. So one day they can become a skilled worker. 
In the amendment bill, we propose that workers cannot just work on their own. They need to work at the direction of and within the scope decided by the instructing supervisor and the method and manner specified by the instructing supervisor. This will provide um, reassurance to water quality. The third category of questions has to do with time bar for prosecution. We propose that the six months should count from the date on which the offense is discovered, mainly because very often when we discover the offense, it will have passed the six-month period. In order that we can take out prosecution, we need to have this amendment. I heard many deputations say that uh, they had their concern about this, but this is not unprecedented. There are similar arrangements in other ordinances, as we said, uh, for example, lifts and escalator ordinance and the electricity ordinance. So this is a practice that has been adopted for other pieces of legislation. Also at the meeting, there are other views that were outside the purview of this amendment exercise. In the second stage of our review work, we will consider the views expressed by deputations in this regard. This is my short introduction to um, category A. Perhaps, uh, Mr. Edward, you you have a question, please. You explained that um, since deputation strongly advised or required that there should be relevant training for plumbing workers, you said it's not necessary. I can't find this acceptable. Look at the difference. Originally, the ordinance stipulates that whatever works it is, they must be undertaken by a licensed plumber. It is a very uh, stringent standard. But now you only require workers who may have no training, but they just have to work under an instructing supervisor. Then, since the worker himself is not trained, his defense will be easy. He can say, I misunderstand an instruction because I know nothing. That will become a reasonable excuse. That loophole can be exploited to do things that are contravening to the law, and then you cannot do anything about it. Well, under the qualifications framework, you need to go through a course, you need to learn the skills and the trade, you have to know that it is safe before you can do it. It's very simple. How can how can you don't introduce this? Mr. Yu, under the designated workers for designated trade framework, if there is an instructing supervisor who is qualified, certain work can be undertaken. This is always allowed. As for training without, within the industry, we will come to that. And uh, that is also responded under B. In fact, some training courses have been added since I was the chairman of the Bills Committee on Designated Workers for Designated Trade, so I'd like to add to the add the information. Well, I'm not trying to answer the question on his behalf, but I'm trying to add some information. But then it is not the same thing because in the WWO it says only licensed plumbers should undertake the work. Sorry, I have to interject. This amendment bill is to pluck or amend something very unreasonable in the original ordinance. In fact, a lot is being done which is regarded as 
contravening to the law, but with this bill, we are trying to make things more reasonable. I can defer to Mr. Vincent Mack. Is it that, Mr. Yu, you still insist that everything must be done by a licensed plumber? No, we are talking about relevant training. Perhaps the DS can answer you. In fact, the next paragraph will address this point. Mr. Mack. Thank you, Mr. Yu, and thank you, the Chairman, for covering some of the ground I'd like to cover. Two points. The ordinance as it is, uh, as said by Mr. Yu, does not reflect our policy intent. What is more important is that it doesn't reflect the existing practices within the trade. The writing of the ordinance does not reflect the policy intent and it doesn't reflect what is actually happening on the ground. And because of this, we'd like to propose an amendment. A lot of people are already doing this on the ground. We don't want to allow this to continue to be illegal. And secondly, all these years, the construction industry can do different things to allow workers to acquire skills. The VTC or the CIC provide a lot of training, but there are quite many workers who have worked under a master and who have learned the relevant skills and then they pass tests so they become a skilled worker. The tests are um, organized by the CIC. This has always been the way the industry functions and this has been the case for quite a long time. So the proposed amendment seeks to reflect the mode of operation in the industry and also our policy intent. Certainly, we understand Mr. Yu's point. That is, if the worker knows nothing, maybe people will be worried about the trade quality. We understand that point. That is why, as I said in my introduction, the worker, if he is new to the trade, then the instructing and supervision requirements would be more stringent because the instructing supervisor would know that the worker uh, knows nothing and he has to provide full uh, supervision. But if the worker has a lot of experience and he in fact knows the trade, then the instructing and supervision requirements will be different. There is this flexibility in the industry depending on the worker's ability. We don't want to put everything in a straitjacket in the bill. Legislation shouldn't be for the purpose of reflecting the uh, current situation. And that is just condoning the wrongs. Now, the license promise are to ensure water um, safety. And, um, but now there is a problem with water safety, and therefore we should amend the law to make water, uh, drinking water safe instead of passing the law to legalize uh, the current illegal practice. If there aren't enough workers, then ask the um, practitioners to undergo the relevant training to ensure safety. This is a minimum requirement. How can you convince people to accept this proposal? Well, I understand your concern. But let us move on uh, to the next part. I know uh, Dr. Lina Wong, uh, I noticed that Dr. Lina Wong has raised her hand and other members have raised their hands. They asked for the floor. So uh, please go to item B and then um, members will ask quest questions. 
with regard to training of the relevant um, trades, um, we have um, the annex. Uh, there is training for semi-skilled workers and skilled workers. As for institution-based training, one is provided by CIC, the other is provided by the VTC. As for VTC courses, they are full-time courses which last for three years. Completion of the course would enable the person to be a licensed plumber after after passing a test. One can also um, participate in an apprenticeship training. Completion uh, will qualify one to be a skilled worker. As a semi skilled as for semi skilled worker, there are four types of courses. A regular one year basic craft course, ninety day full time adult short course, and other and um, two other courses, altogether four courses. The courses organized by the CIC uh, do, um, do require the uh, students to pass a test before becoming a skilled worker or semi skilled worker. A question was asked on the other day in respect of the um, pr um, promotion letter. Um, we have a uh, paper on the progression ladder or progression pathways. Um, there are different uh, ways or pathways. One can follow a master if you want to be a registered skilled worker. Uh, finally, uh, one can become a registered uh, skilled worker. If you study a VTC course, then apart from registering as a skilled worker, you can also one can also uh, study a higher diploma uh, course and will become a um, a supervisor. And one can even study a relevant degree course to be an engineer or to be a professional in the engineering profession. So uh, these are the uh, progression pathways for new entrants and practitioners. Uh, uh, Ms. Alina Wong. Thank you, Chairman. And I thank the Bureau for providing the information. Now, in the annex, with regard to semi-skilled workers and skilled workers, are they the uh, so-called masters and intermediate uh, workers? Uh, Semi-skilled workers are called uh, intermediate workers, and skilled workers are called master workers. What about the uh, temporary workers? They don't need any training, uh, do they? Uh, you need to um, uh, redefine. You need to reiterate the definition. Now we call a temporary worker or provisional worker. It is a uh, transitional arrangement. If you may refer to the table. Now in the last line, registered skilled worker provisional. The last line um, in the uh, third um, column. We provide a, a training course, a special training course, to workers, and after passing the test, one can become a registered uh, skilled worker. Now that was the arrangement during the um, arrangement. Uh, that's arrangement for designated workers for designated skills. There are workers who have not met the uh, des um, skilled worker requirements but who have acquainted who have uh, acquired certain skills or who have attained a certain skill level and therefore the training course is provided to achieve that and so they have not they have been trained to a certain extent but what about untrained workers can they join the trade and participate in the works in plumbing and plumbing works in answering dr yu's question i said and they are ordinary workers. We don't call them uh, semi-skilled workers or skilled workers. Uh, they are ordinary workers. They don't need to undergo uh, 
any um, training, but under the supervision of a master, um, the uh, person can conduct plumbing works. But um, the works are not of high skill level; is mainly menial. But if the uh, worker continue to learn and master or um, um, pick up certain skills, and then, well, Chairman, our main concern is the untrained worker has entered the site and con and carry out plumbing works. You will authorize the uh, water authority or the, the, the WSD rather to check the licenses. Now, for the uh, ordinary workers, that uh, uh, they don't have any registration. If you identify them, will you arrest them? They are general workers. Well, let us call them general workers. When WSD staff identify a certain person, the person will be asked whether he has a registration or not. If he has no registration as a semi-skilled or skilled worker, then he will say no. Then the question, another question, is whether the person is being instructed or supervised on um, plumbing works. If the answer is no, then is in breach. Of, then may be in breach of the law. But if uh, the question is the answer is the affirmative, somebody is supervising and instructing him, then he has not breached the law. So you have to ask who is supervising or instructing you. You must ask. You must ask this question. When we come to a close by close study of the bill, uh, our colleague uh, will ask who is doing the instruction and supervision, and we will try identify whether there is any suspicion. If there are people around, uh, we will. Ask further questions. I, uh, Chairman, I ask the administration to clarify two questions. First, the ordinary workers or general workers don't have a registration. What type of work can he carry out on site, Mr. Mac? As for what kind of work he can carry out on site, it is up to the instructor or the instructing supervisor to decide. Uh, we are talking about um, plumbing uh, works uh, that includes uh, welding and then putting the uh, pipe in place and things like that. Uh, the untrained worker can, um, works under the instruction. It depends on experience of the worker. And the instructing supervisor has to decide what kind of work the ordinary worker is to do. If the ordinary worker is new, then he just uh, do some menial, uh, he just uh, does some menial work. Then I'm concerned, Mr. Chairman. It's only up to the instructing supervisor. He can do anything as instructed, and he can be instructed to do. Um, um, works that require the skills of a registered semi skilled worker or a skilled worker well um there are three types of persons one um the uh, responsible um the l p and then uh, the registered uh, worker and semi skilled uh, skilled worker registered skilled worker and semi skilled worker and then the ordinary worker now in our proposal. Uh, they have different responsibilities. The instructing supervisor has to give suitable instruction and supervision to the uh, general worker according to the experience and ability of the general worker. As far as uh, the scope of instruction and uh, work is concerned, and if it is found that the work is substandard, then uh, we will consider the circumstances as to whom uh, will be held responsible or liable. At the end of the day, the LP is required to ensure that all the materials are up to requirement. 
Uh, there are duties and responsibilities for every post. Uh, Chairman, I find the arrangement very dangerous. You put the responsibility on the instructing supervisor. There will be two problems. First, uh, the one doing the supervision can direct the ordinary or general worker to conduct works that should have been done or that should be done by one who has passed a test and acquired the skills. Therefore, there is no need to undergo any training and get the registration. So you have opened a back door for the skill requirement. The second danger is whether the instructing supervisor is present on site and supervising the general worker all the time. Or just at the start, he gives the instruction to the ordinary worker and then he goes away. And he doesn't know what has happened or what is going to happen. So it's everything on paper and nothing else. Well, that's the danger I want to point out. Can you explain that and how you deal with that, Mr. Mack? The instructing supervisor has to give supervision and instruction according to the experience of the worker. The scope of work is to be decided by the instructing supervisor according to the skill and experience of the general worker. Is it required to be present 100% supervising the general worker? It depends on the experience of the worker. If the worker has three or five years of experience, though he has not been registered and he is about uh, to sit the test and get uh, registered, then it may not be necessary for the instructing supervisor to watch over the um, worker for or the general worker all the time. But if it is a new hand, if he is a new hand, then um, I mean the general worker is a new hand, then he has to be supervised more closely. We cannot put it down in the law. We don't want to put everything in a straight jacket. This is not the practice. Uh, that um, that this is not a new practice. In fact, they have this practice for many years. Now, starting from the first of April, under the designated worker for uh, designated skill, um, the arrangement has been in place. It is since uh, the first of April, and we have monitored the situation. The progress is good. Um, we may need to provide more guidelines. The CIC has already issued some guidelines on being on giving instructions and supervision. The WSD will um, uh, provide guidelines in terms of. Um, instruction, instructing, and supervising workers. Um, that uh, will be done. Chairman, uh, Dr. Elena Wong, I think you have asked questions for a long time. I'm not limiting members' time today, but Mr. Leung Kwok Hong would like to ask a question. Oh, I'll wait for a second round. Yeah, because Mr. Leung has been waiting for a long time. Mr. Leung, please. Thank you, Chairman. There are three types of persons here in the law. The plumber. The plumber is a recognized person who can undertake plumbing works, but then there are very few plumbers on the ground. That is why, in actual practice, many people are not qualified as plumbers. That is why most of the people are working illegally now. And now you want to make the law different so you can tackle that issue. So my first question is, the original ordinance says that everybody who works in plumbing works should be a plumber. That is the legislative intent. But now you change the amendment, uh, the law, and you are saying that you just do not have 
the number of required plumbers necessary. In fact, you are saying the plumber should be a kind of authorized person. But there are three types of persons now. Is that the case? Licensed plumber, registered plumbing worker and registered plumbing worker temporary and the general worker. Even general worker can undertake the work but he has to be supervised. This is where the problem lies. That's right. If the plumber is not there, then a registered plumbing worker can supervise. If the registered plumbing worker is not there, then a registered plumbing worker temporary can do the supervision. Is that right, Mr. Mack? No, the temporary worker cannot do supervision. So only two types of people, the plumber and the registered plumbing worker. Is that right? Yes. Then the problem is you have few plumbers. How many are there? Have you done your counting, Mr. Mack? At the Water Supplies Department, about 3,000. But there are only 1,000 odd who are active. In other words, you lack the manpower. Therefore, you allowed the registered plumbing worker to do this. Is that right? Well, there are registered plumbing workers now, Mr. Mack. Well, I think I should put it this way. I'm not going to play this game with you. Can you allow Mr. Mack to answer you? I have been in this trade. I know you are experienced, but you have asked the question. Let the DS answer you. No, I want to explain to you between a plumber and a registered plumbing worker. What is the difference? Mr. Mack, I'll try to answer. A licensed plumber and a registered plumbing worker uh, there is this main difference between the two. The licensed plumber would know better the vetting and approval procedure. He knows how to submit information to the WSD. He knows what will comply with the regulations and what not. Trade-wise, the requirements are the same as a plumbing worker. But apart from the trade, he has to do documentation. Normally, a worker doesn't need to know what is required on the document side, but a plumber will have to know this. Okay, I'll cut the story short. You mean that a licensed plumber and a registered plumbing worker have the same kind of professional knowledge. There is not a lot of difference trade-wise, okay, but they have different responsibilities. The registered plumbing worker has no responsibility. What responsibilities does he have? Because the licensed plumber will oversee the entire plumbing works project. If there is anything unto what he will be the one taken to task. But most people now work without a license. What I mean is, are you saying that the licensed plumber itself, himself may be a worker? Mr. Leung, your question is clear. Allow the official to answer you. You are repeating yourself, Mr. Mack. Many workers are in fact licensed plumbers. As I said, trade-wise, the plumber has the same kind of knowledge which is required of a worker, but the plumber has to know more. He knows how he has to know how the vetting approval procedure works and he has to submit documents to the WSD. Mr. Leung is saying that the plumbing worker has no responsibility, but that's not true. In our proposal, the licensed plumber may not have to do the work manually, but he has the responsibility. And also, if he actually does the work manually, then his responsibility would be the same as that for a worker. Well, don't waste my time. He's a licensed plumber. When you are given a license, of course, you have responsibilities. Don't dwell on this point. If an engineer has a license, of course he has responsibilities, or else you can engage someone who is an engineer from the mainland or Africa, but he cannot work in Hong Kong. In other words, a licensed plumber should be able to do uh, application, etc., but he has responsibilities. Cut that out, please. 
I think Mr. Mac is making the same point as yourself. Plumbing, plumbers have responsibilities. No, what he is saying is that trade-wise, the licensed plumber is the same as a registered plumbing worker, but then the plumber is licensed. He has certain responsibilities. There are so few of them in Hong Kong now. But then you are telling me that most of the registered plumbing workers can be regarded as the same as licensed plumbers. Mr. Leung, I think I understand your question. But when you talk about responsibilities for licensed plumbers, they are very clear. I think Mr. Mac agrees with you. But with regard to registered plumbing workers, they also have their own work responsibilities. Skill-wise, the worker is at a par with the plumber. He can apply to be tested and get a license. I know there are courses that they can attend. If they have the experience and attend the courses, then they can sit the test for a license. The question is easy. Either you plow resources into the issue so most re registered plumbing workers know their responsibility and then they will escalate to become a licensed plumber so that you can resolve this question of supervision. Mr. Leung, you are very correct and that is exactly what the industry is doing. Mr. Mack, maybe you can explain. Mr. Leung, please bear with us. I think you you are correct. There is a promotion ladder. Mr. Mack, as the chairman said, this is indeed the case. We would like workers who have the skills to read a course which is not very long to understand the vetting and approval procedure and then sit a test, then he can become a licensed plumber. There is this course and we want to attract more technically savvy people in, in other words, those who have the skills to do this, Mr. Leung, Mr. Mack, you do not have enough licensed plumbers. So there is a legal question and you are saying that we should amend the law that the plumber can act as an instructor, supervisor, so other people can do the work. This is the crucial point. My point is this is not enough because you need a big number of licensed plumbers, or else there will always be a problem, as Dr. Helena Wong was saying. These people are not at the site because they are responsible for different sites. The plumber license is at a premium. This is the evil consequence of workers not receiving the necessary training. This is a rent-seeking act. Other people are not thinking of getting promoted. And the problem is, these people are holding sinecure positions. In other words, one supervises five or six sites, and he can't do his work. And if you do not increase the number of licensed plumbers, rather you are saying that a licensed plumber should supervise rather questionable people, because there is a supply of registered plumbing workers. But if there is a lot of work, then they will become registered plumbing workers temporary. There are many people doing the work. There is no supervision to talk of. It's like a referee watching over two soccer matches at the same time. He blows the whistle, but he doesn't know who is offside. You can't have a referee looking over two matches at the same time. Mr. Leung, I don't want to drive the workers out of work. But you must put in a lot of resources to do something. You should have a target that in the short term which should be able to train how many plumbers and encourage the young. If you still go for apprenticeship, it doesn't work. Those young people who can read and write, you should Attract them to join the trade. We understand your concern. I think we need to manage the time. Mr. Leung, please, 
I if you do this, I will have to limit your time to a few minutes. Before we do close by close examination, I'm thinking we can explore into different issues. So I'm not limiting your time to a few minutes, but please, we should distribute the time reasonably. Many members have said they share Mr. Leung's concern, and that is training in the industry. In fact, from the papers, we know that there is this promotion ladder as to whether this is enough. We will show our concern, but in fact, this is not something we can do within the purview of this uh, bills committee. Dr. Helena Wong, Chairman, why the rush? I understand. Ms. Dr. Wong, I'm not rushing. Exactly because I'm not rushing, I'm not limiting your time, Dr. Wong. I'm not limiting your time. Well, Chairman, you are being defensive. The people can see you on television. Why are we asking these questions? Because we are talking about different levels of workers and what training they have received and what type of plumbing works they can undertake and which level of people can act as supervisors who would supervise people who are not qualified. If this is not clarified, even if we rush through with the amendment bill, there will be problems when this is implemented on site. I like the administration to tell us clearly. Here you have the table, but we do not have the uh, ballpark figure for the different types of workers. How many licensed plumbers are there? How many semi-skilled workers are there? How many skilled workers are there? And how many registered plumbing workers temporary are there? And general workers, how many are there? So we know roughly what we are talking about. And we know then how many semi-skilled, skilled or temporary workers there will be on site for a certain project and whether they are actually there. Because if we don't know this, we will not know how the amendment bill is going to be implemented. DS, let me say this before I answer Dr. Wong's question. Actually, I don't know whether members may be misunderstanding the issue. The licensed plumber can be a plumbing worker according to the designated trade or worker for designated trade arrangement. So the licensed worker can work as a worker, but he can also choose to do management only. This is what licensed plumbers can choose. When he chooses to do management, and then he will be a p licensed plumber who has responsibilities. But if he chooses to work as a plumbing worker, then he will be doing that kind of work. I hope this simple explanation can satisfy members. So, Chairman, the administration knows that uh, they should do something about the different tiers of workers. No, it's just very simple. Give us a table. Now, this table lists the training and courses and tests. We just want to know the number of workers of different levels of skills and what type of works or what kind of skills are required for what type of works. So we know who will be qualified to be a supervisor and who can be supervised and the um, grades and skills or, or levels of skills of the workers being supervised. Even the construction sector wants to know uh, what is required. And in this bill, it seems that uh, you have not specified the requirements. Now, concerning registered um, plumbers, uh, 3,110 um, skilled workers, 
registered skilled workers. Sixteen uh, thousand two hundred and seventy-four. Are they registered skilled workers, or semi-skilled workers? They are registered skilled workers or masters. Sixteen thousand two hundred and seventy-four. Yes. Um, thirteen thousand seven hundred and ninety-one semi-skilled workers, and then the rest. Semi-skilled workers, so to sixteen thousand uh, two hundred and seventy-four. As for provisional, about seventy. Registered skilled workers, provisional. As for general workers, they are general workers. The CIC has a registration of about four hundred thousand odd workers. They are general workers. They cannot uh, work on plumbing on their own. They have to be supervised by the semi-skilled workers or skilled workers in carrying out plumbing works. Chairman, I hope that they can give us a paper in respect of um, their work. But it seems that there is a small number of LP, about three thousand odd, and active ones about one thousand odd. So the LPs are not able to be present on each and every site. They can just sign on papers, and the um, most important supervising work uh, falls on the labs of um, the registered skilled workers, thirteen thousand seven hundred ninety-one. They provide supervision um do they provide supervision on uh, general workers and semi skilled workers only uh, well in fact, what about the semi skilled workers can they provide instruction and supervision both semi skilled workers and skilled workers can provide instruction and supervision so how can you distinguish the responsibilities and quality qualifications of the two types, and are there differences in wages? Well, wages are decided by the demand and supply in the market. As for the nature of work, registered skilled workers and semi-skilled workers can in, can carry out plumbing works, uh, but the uh, ex uh, the extent is different. I am worried um, if. Uh, semi-skilled workers can provide instruction and supervision. Some of them may have just received fifty hour, uh, fifty hour skill enhancement course, and some may just have a ninety day full time adult short course. They just have, uh, say, um, fifty hour of uh, work, um, course or ninety day full time course, and they can. Do the work of a skilled worker, even uh, they are registered semi-skilled worker. So are uh, you putting too heavy a burden on the semi-skilled worker? Um, judging at the length of the course, uh, the training is very limited, and he can do the supervision, and uh, he can provide supervision, and he will take the uh, responsibility. Can a semi-skilled worker uh, does his own work and doesn't uh, and refuse to give any supervision to a general worker? Now, on uh, as for how uh, work is distributed on a work site, that will depend on the ability of the workers and the person responsible. Will assign the uh, duties and responsibilities according to the ability of workers. The um, instruction and supervision to be undertaken by a semi-skilled worker will not be a work um, or works that require uh, a high level um, of um, skill. Through the CIC, we want to 
uh, provide more training to the semi-skilled workers so that they will become skilled workers. Training is something we endeavor to do, or we have been endeavoring to do. As um, uh, this is the current situation of the trade or the industry, I understand Miss Wong's concern, but Miss Wong doesn't need to be over worried. Now, after the implementation of the designated workers for designated skills scheme, um, the, uh, situ the, the uh, scheme is going well. Uh, Mr. Siu Kafai, I want to follow up on the point raised by Ms. Wong. Uh, she has a good point concerning the semi-skilled workers. Logically speaking, they are okay. Then why should they sit for a test for a skilled worker? If the skilled worker is okay, then why he want to be a LP? There must be a difference. Now you're going to criminalize um, offenses, and they will have there, there is criminal liability. And after he has conducted, he has carried out many work, uh, much works. Uh, he may be caught and sent to jail uh, in the last day of his work. After decades of work, so I'm concerned about supervision and liability. I think the bureau and the department have to think twice whether that's really uh, feasible, and also there is a time uh, limit or time bar. Say, so, uh, when a case is exposed. Then you blame it on the semi-skilled worker, but the semi-skilled worker has not uh, study, uh, has not acquired such a skill. Yet, yet uh, he provided supervision to the general worker. After the lead in water incident, uh, people uh, treat it um, seriously. But how can you acquire the skill? How can you make the judgment? There may be just a thousand or so active uh, LPs in there for a lot of people are drawn into the uh, quagmire, but other people don't have the skills. Mrs. Seal, let me explain that the the reason for this bill is up to you to say whether the uh, wording is problematic and whether there is a need to amend the provision uh, the, the uh, wording. The Waterworks Ordinance only um, spells out that the LP has to do ev everything. There is no definition for uh, masters and semi-skilled workers. But within the trade, there is the, there is the division of labor, and people are concerned that the responsibility. Uh, our liability is uh, put on the shoulders of uh, these uh, people, then um, there may be uh, problems. I think there is a need to understand why the um, division of labor is clarified in the bill. Uh, Mr. Mack. Well, uh, in response to the chairman, I'm a bit confused. In the past, before this paper, um, were, uh, were the uh, masters and semi-skilled workers held responsible? Should there be any problem, they are not. They were not allowed to work. They were not allowed to carry out the work. The waterworks ordinance. Uh, prohibited these people from carrying out plumbing service, plumbing work. There is criminal liability at present. Mr. Mack, please explain. Two points. As said by the as said by the chairman, before the amendment of the law, anyone who is not a licensed plumber who carries out waterworks, a designated waterworks. Then he has uh, committed an offence. 
Basically, the law has not reflected our leg our policy intent, and therefore we want to amend the law. Your definition is supervision of working. You require all licensed plumbers to conduct the works. Is it the reality? Is it the reality? Most of the works are not conducted in this way, and that's why that's why we change the law at the start of the meeting. We have already explained the unreasonable aspect of the law, and therefore we want to amend the、um, law. Now you have to check all the、uh, works, and、um, the LP just looks at. The LP just looks at the work done. Yes, we understand that there must be division of labor. The LP will have to、uh, fix the pipes, do the welding, and carry the、uh, pipes. And、uh, that's why、um, the law is problematic, and we amend. We want to amend the law. Chairman, I know your point. You don't have enough people. And、therefore, you extend the coverage to the master workers or semi-skilled workers, but you raise them to the level of、um, being liable. Is it reasonable then, Mr. Mac? As I've explained, a LP and a skilled worker is different, not in terms of skills. The requirement, the skill requirement. Uh, upon a skilled worker or upon a LP is the same, but the LP、uh, has to make applications for approval. He has to meet. He understands the requirement of the law because he has undergone training, and after training, after he passes the test, he can become a LP. Um, when works are carried out, from the skill point of view, view, we do not require all works to be carried out by LP. He has the skills. If one has the skill, one is allowed to work. The difference between semi-skill and skill workers、uh, is this: if you.、Um, Um, you progress from a general worker to a semi-skilled worker to a skilled worker. You have to、uh, go through a certain pathway from being a general worker to become a master or a registered skilled worker. You can first become a semi-skilled worker. That is acceptable in the trade. And after you reach a certain level, you have a higher pay. We don't want to stop at the level of semi-skilled worker. We want the worker, or we hope the worker, after becoming a semi-skilled worker, will continue、um, to move on to acquire the qualification of a skilled worker. There are about thirteen thousand odd. A skilled worker, a skilled worker, and about just two、uh, thousand or so semi-skilled worker. So people are moving on.、Um, we,、uh, in terms of skill, a skilled worker is just like that of an LP. I can see that while you were saying,、um, Mr. Horace Lee, senior engineer, was shaking his head. Uh, no, I was nodding my head. You mean you were nodding your head when I see you shake your head, Chairman? Okay, now this is clearer, Mr. Chairman. The ordinance states that it is not done by a licensed plumber. It is already criminal. Is that the case? Is that the case, Mr. Shiu? This is not. We are. Saying just today, we have said that on the first day of the bills committee. Okay, okay, I won't talk about past cases. You are providing an amendment. What is your judgment? 
about the skilled workers. You say there are over 10,000 of them and they should be able to do it. So you are drawing them in. And the semi-skilled workers, you're providing them with this ladder. You're training them. And you think that semi-skilled workers can also be an instructor. So they are also drawn in. Is that right? Well, no, they're not doing supervision. It is just that some of the work can be instructed by these semi-skilled workers, so general workers can undertake the work. What do you mean by some of the work? If you talk about the entire plumbing system on construction sites, the responsibility will still lie with the licensed plumber. Chairman, you said some of the trades. Uh, there are the main water pipes and then the branches. Is it that the semi-skilled workers can watch over the plumbing works for the entire system? Do they have the knowledge? Basically, skilled workers and semi-skilled workers are required to have different technical skills. Maybe I can defer to Mr. Lee to give you the details. Thank you for the question. Technically, skilled and semi-skilled workers are different. And you can see this from the contents of the tests. If you want to become a semi-skilled worker, you have to sit the test for three hours or so, and he will be able to complete the test of the plumbing system within a room. If you are talking about a unit uh, for residence use, and uh, a semi-skilled worker should be able to supervise that. But a skilled worker will have to cover a bigger area. As Mr. Shield was saying, he should be able to look after larger pipes, uh, the outer wall system, including the heating system. These are the skilled workers. There is a difference. Very good. I'd like to ask whether this is clear in the ordinance. What can semi-skilled workers do? What can skilled workers do? Mr. Shiel, this should be covered by the designated trade for designated workers arrangement. This should be in the appendix, is that right? The trade, nature of trade, etc. It is not within the ordinance, is that right, Mr. Mack? That's correct. As the chairman said, we are bringing in the skilled workers and the semi-skilled workers. In fact, under the Designated Trade for Designated Workers Ordinance, there is this schedule stating the kind of work the different workers can undertake. That is in an appendix or schedule to the Designated Trade for Designated Workers Ordinance. Next speaker. Mr. Leng Chen, did you raise your hand? No? Okay. Who is it now? Dr. Elena Wong. Chairman, Mr. Mac said that um, the work that can be undertaken by workers are in the schedule to the designated workers ordinance. I hope to have that table, please. And what about the work that he can supervise and uh, who the workers are supervised by and who do the workers supervise? Have you clarified the accountability of different levels of workers? If not, we should really be asking these questions because you talk about instructing supervisors who are held responsible. Who are the instructor supervisors? Uh, I'm very worried about this. I do agree that the administration should assist the construction industry, the plumbing industry to do training for their workers. I also agree that there is a promotion ladder. So there is a prospect and so People will be happy to join the trade that with proper training they can be promoted. And then what is more important is you have to delineate clearly what kind of work can be undertaken by what tier of workers. If you say it is already in the designated workers ordinance, then let us have the table. Because later on if there is contamination of drinking water, then we have to trace who should be held responsible. But uh, this is not in the ordinance now. We are worried that unqualified people will become supervisors and in the end they have to be held liable. And we are concerned whether it is reasonable to hold those people liable. My initial view is 
that only the licensed plumber should be an instructor, supervisor, or at most a skilled worker. If you can make sure that skilled workers can do supervision, you can allow skilled workers and licensed plumbers to be supervisors. There are about 2,000 semi-skilled workers. Do they have the qualification and ability to do supervision because that attracts criminal liability? I therefore have reservations about having semi-skilled workers do supervision. Unless you state what kind of supervision they can do, say, if uh, something is not related to water quality or safety, then they can do the supervision, etc. You must state what kind of supervision work is being done or else it is hard for the industry to follow. It may be that junior workers would be supervising even more junior workers. We want to protect water quality and water safety, but we also want to protect grassroots workers who should not be made liable for responsibilities that originally belong to licensed plumbers. I think Dr. Wong has made a very good proposal because under the Construction Workers Registration Ordinance, there is description of the traits for different workers. And as for working under supervision, uh, that ordinance is also very comprehensive. Perhaps you can write papers to supplement it or you can give an oral reply now. I propose to submit the information after the meeting because we have spent quite some time on this point. I hope I can give a written reply later. Dr. K.K. Kwok, Chairman. We would like to tidy up the trade by assigning accountability. But in the ordinance, relatively junior grassroots workers are made to shoulder the largest responsibility, at least in the lead in water incident, that is the case. But the subcontractors or the developers were able to get off the hook. I don't think we can explain the issue of Ng Tak Sum. As you know, he is incapacitated and it is impossible for him to supervise so much work and yet he was held responsible because he signed papers. And therefore, we are making the junior people responsible. The developers and subcontractors are not held liable. I will not object to you introducing some skilled workers and semi-skilled workers who should be held responsible as well. I think that is reasonable, but if the project is a major one, these workers will not be able to decide on the plumbing material to be purchased. They will just install what is purchased by the boss. And you can't ask them to test for the presence of lead because they're just workers. And yet you are trying to ask skilled workers and semi-skilled workers to be responsible. Apart from the defense provision, how can you protect them? How would they know whether a pipe is lead-free? They would say, um, it is from Shenzhen, just trust me, but then if lead is found, they would be held liable. And then some people may say, this is already a composite unit, the boss says it's okay, just install it. How can you address our doubts? Because the boss, the developer, will decide what materials to buy and the level of profit. Altogether, you have 10,000 odd plumbers. Well, we understand if it is just a small residential unit, the plumber or the skilled worker should be able to purchase the materials according to their own um, thinking. But if it is a major 
really big project. How can you get to the root of the problem? You also allow that in the interim, the skilled workers and semi-skilled workers can supervise unqualified people. That is responsible because they have been in the trade for decades. They may not be able to sit any examination. They may be very skilled, but they are illiterate. They can join a pipe, but they can't write. With time, these people who can't read and who do not take the test will be exploited, phased out, or driven out of work. Mr. Mack, thank you, Chair. We definitely agree with Dr. Kwok that, apart from frontline workers, subcontractors, and the main contractor, and even the professionals and the developers, should all work together to do supervision. We agree that we need to address this point. As I said, there are two stages. In this stage, we will tackle the major issue first, that the law does not reflect the policy intent. That is why uh, we are taking this first step. The Development Bureau and the WSD have started, in fact, the second phase. We are looking how we can supervise the different stakeholders. We are doing the review now, and as I said last time, hopefully by early next year, we can put forward a proposal for consulting the trade. And after discussion, we'll come back to let's go to let members know our opinion. This is what we're doing. Secondly, Dr. Kwok shows concern to us workers who are illiterate, whether they will be exploited. In fact, it is exactly because of this that when we passed the designated workers ordinance, we introduced the old master system. If someone has over 10 years of experience, then we will allow them to be registered as a skilled worker. This is already implemented through the designated workers ordinance, and that includes plumbing workers. So the number I gave you already covered workers who can get a skilled worker license without sitting the examination. They are people who have accumulated the experience working under a master, and they will still be registered as a skilled worker. If this amendment bill is passed, they will be able to act as a plumbing worker legally in a construction site. And so you don't have to worry that they will be exploited. Okay, uh, skilled workers require 10 years of experience. What about semi-skilled workers? In fact, we only require semi-skilled workers, uh, as Mr. Lee said, uh, a test which will last three and a half hours. We will see whether he has that kind of skills. If he passes the test, then passes the test, then he will get the registration. So it doesn't count a, a year of service. So is there a deadline? No, there isn't. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Now concerning policy issues, uh, members have asked questions, and the administration has responded. And there will be further um, supplementary information given to members. The Waterworks Amendment Bill 
may not be able to cover uh, different uh, trades and the actual work to be done in respect of different trades and uh, what is um, the supervision and who can do the supervision and things like that. They really need supplementary. These really need uh, supplementary information, and this may be covered by the construction workers registration ordinance. If I may now suggest that uh, we will go into the clause by clause study of the bill. When we go over the bill clause by clause, we may be able to find answers to questions asked earlier, and we may have more questions. But anyways, we have to uh, conduct uh, this clause by clause study of the bill. I suggest we go over the Chinese version. And after reading the Chinese version, if you have any questions concerning the English version, then you can uh, raise them as well. Uh, but let us go to the Chinese version first. Let us go to paper CB1962-1617-01. The Chinese version. Uh, this uh, enables us to know uh, the uh, what works uh, ordinance more uh, in greater detail. So it's to lead us through the uh, clause by clause study. You may also refer to the bluebell. But I think the uh, markup copy um, enables us to know the original provision and the amendment. Yes, uh, the secretary. Yes, thank you, chairman. The purpose of the bill is to amend the Waterworks Ordinance and Waterworks Regulation um, to revise the requirements relating to the carrying out of works on fire services and inside services. This is the uh, purpose of the bill. Uh, part 1, Preliminary. Number one, uh, section one, uh, or rather clause one, clause one, short title and commencement. The ordinance may be cited as the Water Works Amendment Ordinance 2017. Yes, uh, you can refer to the blue bell. Please go on. C eight one one. C eight one one, the English version. Clause 1, subclause 2. This ordinance comes into operation on day to be appointed by the Secretary for Development by notice published in the Gazette. If I may go on. Clause 2. Annex amended. Enactments amended. Uh, subclause 1. The Waterworks Ordinance Cap 102 is amended as set out in Part 2. The Waterworks Regulations, Cap 102, Subleg A, are amended as set out in Part 3. So if I may go on to Part 2. Part 2. That's in particular in respect of amending Cap 102. Members may refer to the markup copy in there, you can see uh, what is added to which provision uh, so that you can have a better understanding of the original provisions under the Waterworks Ordinance. Part 2, Amendments to the Waterworks Ordinance. Clause 3 is to amend Section 2, Interpretation. This is uh, 9621617. Uh, we propose to add two definitions. 
registered plumbing worker. A registered plumbing worker provisional. These two definitions um, will be uh, further referred to in the um, annexes. Section 4 or clause 4 amends section 10 disconnection of a fire service or inside service under section 10F uh, 10F we repeal um we um repeal um Entering the premises or carrying out any function under section 12, and uh, and then we add or 15a. Originally, it just specified section 12, but we now add section 15a. You may refer to the markup copy. The original provision is. Entering the premises or carrying out any function under Section 12, but now we add one more, and that is or 15a. That is entering the premises or carrying out any function under Section 12 or 15a. When we come to 15a, you know what uh, is added, or what will be added, and then uh, clause five is to add sections 13A and 13B before section 14. We are going to add these two clauses to define what is meant by specified plumbing works and what is meant by carrying out specified plumbing works under instruction and supervision. Specified plumbing works means the construction, installation, maintenance, alteration, repair, or removal of a fire service or inside service. Um, carrying out specified plumbing works under instruction and supervision means a person carries out specified plumbing works under the instruction and supervision of the supervisor. As I've explained to Ms. Wong, uh, the scope has to be specified and the method and manner has to be specified. The supervisor specifies the method and manner. Uh, Ms. Alina Wong. Now on this point, who is the supervisor is important. And worker of what skill level can supervise another worker of what skill level? We don't have the uh, information from the administration, and it's hard to discuss this. Maybe we can um, set the discussion aside. Uh, Ms. Wong wants to know more about this. As for supervisor, is there any uh, definition for supervisor in the bill or in other parts of the law? Yes, there is. I'll try to find it out for you. I think it's on page 7. The legal advisor um, Referred me to zero 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 seven six
a person 60, a person who carries out specified plumbing works under the instruction and supervision of a licensed plumber or registered plumbing worker. Yes, I agree with you, Mr. Chairman. Exactly. This is the point. So a semi-skilled worker can be a supervisor. Registered plumbing worker does include semi-skilled worker. Uh, that's why we are spent so much time at the beginning and asked many questions. I'm of the view that if a semi-skilled worker is responsible for giving instructions and supervision, then the law has to specify uh, what works or what kind of works. A semi-skilled worker can give instruction and supervision and what kind of works he is not allowed. Otherwise, there will be a serious problem. Uh, they have already explained that they will give a supplementary paper to explain the point further. I think the administration has heard the member's view. Yes, we've heard it. As for 13B, you're going to add 13B, right? And 13B, B, um, the method and manner in which the specified plumbing works are carried out are uh, specified by the supervisor. There will be uh, supervision in respect of works of a minor nature. I don't know the Chinese. Uh, works of a minor nature. But you have not defined what do you mean by works of a minor nature. After 13b, should you not add a new section, which is 13c, to uh, provide the meaning of works of a minor nature to clarify the point? Shouldn't you clarify the meaning of works of a minor nature? I suggest maybe. Involvement of specified, uh, specialized trade skill that requires specific knowledge and ability acquired through designated training for carrying out the works. And B, works which do not change the general arrangement of the plumbing installation already approved by the water authority or affect the flow conditions of the plumbing system, thus causing poss uh, possible supply problems. Okay. I think you have not defined defined what is meant by works of a minor nature, and I suggest you add 13C in respect of works of minor nature. Uh, Mr. Mack, have you heard the suggestion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I think it was at the first meeting uh, this point was raised, and we did respond uh, to this point. Concerning works of a minor nature, it will be works uh, conducted without um, any um, supervision of the designated person. So are you saying that there is no need to define what is meant by works of minor nature? We say that the WA on his uh, website has already um, described works of a minor nature. If the alteration does not affect the alignment of the original pipe, which is a, a kind of small-scale work, well, yes, I do agree with you. That is why I'm proposing that this should be written into the law, that it will not affect what has been approved by the WSD and it will not affect the major decisions of the WSD, or else they may foul up the work. Why well, I have heard Dr. Wong, we can go back and think about the operational side. 
to see whether there are unresolved problems because our initial view is that the WA is empowered under the law to decide what is of a minor nature. But if we put it back into the ordinance now, then the WA will not have that power anymore. And that is what is something of a minor nature. I understand Dr. Wong's request, but we need to take a look at actual operation. Chairman, now can I ask a question first? Where is the empowerment done? 15, 004, 14 bracket 2. Sets here that the water authority may waive the requirement of permission under subsection 1 in case of alterations to a fire service or inside service which are, in his opinion, of a minor nature. And then page 6. 15, 2. Even 15 itself. Alterations or repairs to a fire service or inside service which are in the opinion of the water authority of a minor nature. Therefore, the WA is empowered here. Should you define minor nature or would you like to preserve flexibility to allow the WA to make decisions? Mr. Matt, you will consider that point right? Yes. We will see whether there are unresolvable problems operationally. Okay, you will consider Dr. Wong's view. Chairman, my proposal is not to take away the power of the WA. We understand. I'm just worried that some designated persons at a certain level may foul up what is of a minor nature. In other words, the alterations are not minor. And uh, the specifications, for example, are originally decided by the licensed plumber or the WSD. And I'm saying the powers should be written into the ordinance and minor nature should be defined. Okay, you have heard Dr. Wang. Please continue, Mr. Mack. Clause 6. This amends section 14 under 1, we like to change the title. We say restriction on construction, etc. of fire services and inside services. Uh, this is to reflect the original intent. It is not any kind of limitation. This is the title of that clause. If there is no question, let us look at subsection 2. We will repeal bracket 1 for it to be replaced by the new subsection 1. Subject to subsection 2, a person must not construct, install, alter or remove a fire service or inside service unless the water authority has granted written permission for it. I'd like to explain why we are proposing this amendment. The original ordinance gives approval to a person. If you want to undertake plumbing works, you need to get the relevant approval. So the approval is given to a person. But we think a more satisfactory way is to give approval for a project. If there is approval for a project, then people can work on it. So you don't need to give approval to each and every person working on the project. This is the rationale behind this amendment. Please continue. After one, we add in one capital A. A person who contravenes subsection 1 commits an offence. 
In fact, this is in the ordinance. It is just that it is at fourteen bracket four. We are just moving it up to behind one. Good. Please carry on. Under fourteen two, or actually after that, we add in two capital A. The water authority may grant. The written permission on the authority's own initiative or on the application of a licensed plumber. The ordinance now does not provide how the WA should grant the permission. Normally, this is done on the application of a licensed plumber, but sometimes the WA can take his own initiative and grant written permission. And this is really mostly uh, about government projects. Okay, no particular views. Please continue. We are repealing 14 bracket 4. And then we Replace it with subsections 4, 5, 6, and 7. The original bracket 4 says any person who contravenes subsection 1 or 3 shall be guilty of an offence. We have 1A to cover contravention of subsection 1. And now we deal with subsection 3. Why do we have to add in so many subsections? It is because we now introduce different persons. We only talked about licensed plumbers, but now there are plumbing workers and general workers. That is why we need to add subsections 4 to 7 to provide for penalties for different persons. The new subsection 4 reads, if subsection 3 is contravened in relation to the construction or installation of a fire service or inside service, or any part of it, each of the following persons commits an offence. A. A person under whose instruction and supervision the construction or installation is carried out. And this is the worker, the general worker. He may be held liable because if uh, the work is against the supervision. So A is about the worker and B, the person who is working, actually working. No, sorry, sorry. No, sorry, A should be the one giving the supervision and B should be the one who actually carries out the work and C is the licensed plumber but he doesn't work manually and he doesn't do supervision but he does the management and these people can all be held liable. Dr. Wong, sorry I'm confused. Can you clarify? Who is the supervisor? Who is the A is the supervisor. The English is clearer. The construction or insulation is carried out. And B is the worker who is being instructed. And supervision or another person or not. So whether or not he is supervised, uh, he carries out the work and that is under for B. C is the licensed plumber, but he is not responsible for instruction or supervision. He doesn't carries out the work neither. B gives no regard for supervision or otherwise, um, is, as long as the person who carries out the work, then he is included. That's correct. 
as to whether he breaks the law. That depends whether he has a defence. That's correct. It is found that the materials do not meet requirements. Then these three types of persons can be held liable. And then in five, six, and seven, we provide the defence. So C is the licensed plumber, but he is not the one carrying out the work. What if he is a licensed plumber and he also carries out the work? Or he will be caught under B. If there is an overlapping of roles, that person is under B. Then what if he does supervision? Then he will be caught under A. Therefore, the licensed plumber can instruct people under him, and then he may also carry out the work. It's just that the chance is slim, and A and C can overlap. When there is an overlap, it will be A instead of C. We also write here that he is not caught under A or B, but any licensed plumber would do supervision. He can't just sign his name. That is why there is C. But you don't stipulate whether he needs to do supervision. Is it that theoretically a licensed plumber will always supervise, Mr. Mac? Well, this is a work division issue. The plumber can only do management, or he can do supervision, and he can ask somebody to do the supervision for him. So it depends on the case. B is、uh, doing supervision, and A he only gives instruction and supervision. But apart from A and B, there will be some cases where. The plumber doesn't only supervise, or he doesn't carry out the work, and、uh, we'd like to include him under C. Therefore, theoretically, A to C would cover all categories. But under A, you don't say whether semi-skilled workers can be a supervisor. We'll come to that later. We will be making the proposal later. But I don't agree with you. Well, we know your view. Will the administration put forward a CSA as to workers at what level can be a supervisor? As the chairman said, we will submit a paper later on about、uh, present instructions and supervision work, and to see whether, after reading that paper, Dr. Wong would like to amend this provision. And chairman, about A, B, and C. I think we need D. Here you deal with the designated persons,、uh, those who can undertake plumbing works, but those who should be held accountable should include those who decide to recruit workers, and I mean the contractors. They are the ones who engage people. However, this bill only regulates licensed plumbers and those under them. You say you will tackle contractors, material suppliers later, but the bill should already put down a marker that these people should also be held responsible. And I would propose to increase、uh, to include D. Um, which has to specify that those who employ or permit、uh, persons under four A, B, and C、um, to conduct work、uh, to carry out works approved by the、um, WSD,、uh, these、uh, people may be liable. Mr. Mac,、um, section fifteen. Uh, does say that if a person employs unqualified、um, workers is in breach of the law, you mean the original provision, the newly added provision? 
um, we have amendments made to section. We have proposed amendments made to uh, fifteen uh, section fifteen, and some will be done in the next phase. Does section fifteen deals with employment or appointment of persons? Um, we are now. We should first focus on uh, sub section four. If there is no further question, we will move on to subsection five. We propose to give a defence to the three types of persons. As for persons mentioned in four A and four C, we propose to give a defence to such a person. The person has taken all reasonable steps to ensure that carrying out the construction or installation would not contravene subsection three. This is a defence, and for B, for the person mentioned in sub, uh, subsection four B, the person establishes that the person believed that carrying out the construction and installation would not contravene subsection three, and it it was reasonable for the person to so believe. This is a defence newly added. Yes, Miss Wong. Oh yes, sorry, Chairman. I think um, I've missed one point. Can I go back to fourteen one a? Fourteen one a. It is about what can be installed and what cannot be installed. It shouldn't. Something be added after fourteen one a that is one b, which is to uh, specify the the materials that have been approved in writing, and there should be a time limit. The certificate or time limit should not be valid within fifty years. For such a long period of time, there should be a deadline. Is it five years at present? Say after your approval, within five years, the materials approved can still be used, but uh, there is no such provision in the present bill. Should we therefore add one B to deal with this issue, Miss Mac? With regard to all. Um, Plumbing works covering both fire services, fire service, and inside service.、Um, they will have to comply with the specifications in the law. They have to meet those requirements. As for the、um, five-year period referred to by Miss Wong, it is an administrative arrangement. All plumbing materials have to comply with the specifications. As for the administrative requirement,、um, I mean this to facilitate the contractors and LPs to、uh, shorten、uh, the period for waiting for approval. We have a general acceptance arrangement. The Uh, required parts uh, will have the approvals first, so that、um, the approval will not be needed before each and every、uh, piece of work. The law requires that all materials to be used will have to comply with the latest. Um, requirements specified in the law. Therefore, there is no need to stress it here again. The standard itself. There is only one standard that is in line with the requirement. Now, Chairman, I suggest to add this because under one,、um, without any、uh, written permission. 
One must not uh, conduct any construction, installation, alteration, or removal of fire services or inside uh, fire service and inside service. I just suggest that you add one B, that the written permission has a time limit, uh, which is no longer than the time limit under Schedule One. Mr. Mac. Let me explain, Mr. Chairman. Now, the written permission is required so that the WA is aware of what waterworks are going on. And before one conducts any waterworks, one has to get the approval of the Water Authority. In the future, we will conduct inspections. We understand. Uh, at what time, what water works are going on, and then we will send our staff to conduct inspections. Now, will this happen? Now, after you've given them the written permission, um, you also specify in your written permission the parts that have to be used, and the parts have gone through tests and um, the and that lasts for that permission lasts for five years. Now the permission has been obtained, but they just wait, and um, they f they may wait for more than five years. So that's about the length of the uh, granted uh, written permission, and also the content. My view is that there is no need to put it down in the bill in order uh, to cast it in iron. Uh, the conditions um, can be specified by administrative measures, and there may be different requirements and different times. But let the administration answer. If you uh, give a written permission, will you set a time limit? Say you have to start works within a year, otherwise, if they come back to me, the standards may change over time. Maybe after one or two years, the original. Uh, Approval uh, may lead to uh, may may not uh, have um, materials available in the market. I think um, we will do it uh, by administrative arrangement rather than by putting it down in the law. We'll think about it uh, after a permission is given. We may specify. That uh, the uh, permission will have a certain expiry date, and after the expiry date, an approval will have to be sought again. Um, we may think well, we can think about it. That is that will be an administrative arrangement. Will somebody challenge your uh, legal um, capability or legal status? Well, the power is given to the WA. Under the law, yes, we, we we think about it. Now you approve uh, the permission uh, that the works. Uh, you should set a uh, an expiry date. I think one has to be reasonable. If you apply for approval now, you certainly will not conduct the works after ten years. Well, anyways, we will look into that. All right, let us move on to uh, subsections uh, five, six, and seven. I've read out five. Let me now move on to six. Without limiting subsection five a, the person mentioned in subsection four a must not be regarded as having taken all reasonable steps if the person did not, having regard to the matters set out in subsection seven, inspect the carrying out of the construction and installation, the works. As often as reasonable to ensure that the works are carried out in a, in compliance with this ordinance. What does it mean? It is to explain the uh, requirements in giving instruction and supervision. He cannot just. Um, pay lip service. He just put down his name and doesn't uh, check, and doesn't inspect, and doesn't supervise. 
and the factors to be con the matters to be considered include uh, uh, under 7a the nature of the works the risk involved in the works and knowledge and experience of the person carrying out the works I suggest we stop here um, the uh, f uh, I believe Miss Wong uh, will have um, questions and comments in the subsequent parts because uh, there is a um, there are provisions in respect of who may carry out specified plumbing works and Ms. Wong is concerned about the division of liability and responsibility between semi skilled workers and workers and uh, skilled workers uh, Mr. Mac has agreed to provide supplementary information in writing and uh, there is a reference may also be made to the um, registration of uh, construction workers registration ordinance the um, 5th of July 8:30 or uh, another date but we are not able to make a decision today because uh, there are changes in the meetings well i uh, i will come back on the 11th of July but i'm not available on the 5th of July well, uh, Chairman, we also have a team visiting Israel on the 22nd, I believe, and we may not be able uh, to meet again before um, summer. Even if we've completed the study, we will not be able to uh, report uh, to the Council uh, before the summer recess, and there may be CSAs by the administration. So. You really can't hurry. Well, I I don't want to hurry through. I want to give members mental, uh, ample time. I just want to point out that members are repeating the questions. I uh, thank you for giving your valuable input. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.